This is Dummy World. The man replies, my wife. <laughs> I didn't know where that one was going, but that's pretty good. This is Demi World, the podcast your mom told you not to listen to. <laughs> I'm Cindy. I'm Kelly. And today we're going to talk about cold cases. True crime cold cases. True crime cold cases. Um, do you want to go ahead and start or do you want me to I think I can start. Okay, go for it. Um, So the cold case I picked is very famous, gets a lot of notoriety. I think notoriety is good. This is a very popular case in the true crime sector as if people want to know who did it, who done it. Who done it. It's the ultimate who done it. So the cold case I picked, the ultimate who done it for me, is the John Benet Ramsey case. And good choice. Yeah, you know, it's just endlessly fascinating, and you could really spend a whole season talking about this case, because it's really expansive. But when I think about it, I think about the movie based on the board game Clue, where Mm -hmm. there's a murder that happened in a mansion, and it's like, it could have happened this way, or maybe it happened this way, or perhaps it happened Here's this way. Here's how it really happened. Which we'll, we'll probably never know how it really happened. And I think that's kind of why this case is interesting, too. Well, now that Patsy's passed away, no, we probably never will know how. Okay, so let's let's get the facts out there and then we can discuss. Because it's an interesting one to discuss. So, John Benet Ramsey um, was six years old and she died somewhere between the night of December 25th and the morning of December 26th, 1996 in Boulder, Colorado. And she was found dead in her house. In her house at that time also were her nine-year-old brother, Burke, her 39-year-old mother, Patsy, and her 53-year-old father, John. Um, I was 15 when... This case happened, and I was living in Colorado, but I don't really think I paid much attention to it until a couple years later, and my sister actually was dating someone who used to work in the Boulder District Attorney's Office, Mm -hmm. and he believed that Patsy, the mother, was responsible. Um, He believed that, I guess the theory, there are two prevailing theories regarding Patsy, Uh, It was parental rage, either from her getting upset at John Bonet wetting the bed, which she was a chronic bedwetter, and she got upset and somehow hit her daughter's head with something heavy or knocked her daughter's head into something heavy and provided a a fatal blow, and she died. Or Can I I just say something about parental rage as one person who has experienced (laughs) it? Yes, please do. Um, it escalates. So if that is the case that she backhanded her daughter into something, that yes. wouldn't have been the first time she'd done that. Right. Right. She would have she would have hit that daughter, her daughter more than once. Right. Interesting. I think as when we discuss other possible suspects in the case as far as escalation goes. Mm-hmm. Um, so then the second prevailing theory that this guy who worked in the DA's office had was that Patsy did it. Again, I think parental rage because she walked in on the father molesting the six-year-old daughter and freaked out and hit her, pushed her into something. She had a, a head wound. Oh, so um, it was, it, you think it would be like um, a jealousy sort of thing? Um, I, I don't know if it was like a jealousy sort of thing, but more just like a just like freaking out that it was mm-hmm. happening. And okay. yeah, so that's kind of what I heard. So... Here's what we do know about the case is initially early in the morning on December 26th, um, there was a 911 call that came from Patsy, the mother, that they had a kidnapping. There was a ransom note found in the house and there was a kidnapping. So that's sort of like how it was treated. And then eight hours later, uh, 
the body of John Bonet was found in the basement and she had been bound, gagged, strangled. Um, and then we would find out later that she actually had a head wound that turned out to be, to be fatal. So that's how it started. And then I think from the beginning, there are sort of the way that people perceived this case was split into two camps. Either there was the intruder did it theory or the family did it theory. And I am of a family member theory did it person. And I think you are too, right, Cindy? Oh, yeah. I mean, 90% of these types of crimes are perpetrated by somebody close to the family or inside the family. Yeah. And this one is like pretty obvious that someone in, in the family did it. So we're well, it just seems like, like a cover up. So I mean, yeah. just so, so many just, strange things. We're just not going to even talk, like discuss the intruder theory because that's like we a don't whole like other, it. So we're just going to we're just going to ignore it. Yeah. OK. So here is what we and I, so I believe the family, someone in the family did it, but I don't know who did it. It could have been the mother. It could have been the nine-year-old brother. And those are like the two most popular suspects, but, and no one seems to really think about the dad, but I don't see why he couldn't why have. Why he can't be, yeah. Yeah, a suspect too. So, so here's sort of like what we do know. Um, so the coroner has put her death somewhere between 10 p.m. on the evening of December 25th and 6 a.m. on December 26th. And the 911 call came in at like 6 a.m. And she had been, I think, in advance rigor mortis by the time she was found. And um, so they put the the time of death closer to like the 10 p.m. on December 25th. Okay. Okay, so here's what we know. Um, the family came home from a Christmas party, they said about nine o'clock at night, and they insist that John Benny was sleeping and they carried her to bed. I saw an interview where the dad said that the brother Burke was up playing with some Christmas toys, trying to put it together. And, uh, John, the dad said that he helped Burke put together this toy and I think he quote said something like because it's just easier that way I think he was sort of implying which people really know is that Burke had some behavioral problems and so my sense from the dad was that Burke was playing with his toy and um he wasn't you couldn't get him to go to bed and so his dad just kind of said that he helped him put this toy together and that he went to bed. But I kind of wouldn't doubt that he just let the kid do his thing because it was easier that way. Right. Um, and then he, the dad said he went to bed and there's evidence that he did go to sleep. His his side of the bed had been slept in. Um, Patsy's side of the be- bed, on the other hand, her covers had never even been pulled down and no one had slept on top of it. And she stayed in her in her clothes all night. So we're just going to assume that Patsy never went to bed. She says that she did actually sleep on top of her covers, um, like in the slip she had under her dress or whatever. Um, That's weird. That's just weird. I know. It's weird. So It's weird. It's December in Colorado. I mean, how warm is the house to not sleep under the covers in a slip? Right, exactly. And then to like get up the next morning and and put on the party outfit that you had on the night before. Like, yeah, that's just weird. That's just that's weird. weird. Um, I do also want to add that this was a big house. It's a seventy five hundred square foot house. It's big, and so the parents like their third floor was just their bedroom. So like they had the whole upstairs. The kids' bedrooms were one floor below them. The living space was one floor floor below that, and then the basement was in the basement. So really, there's like kind of four three story house with a basement. Yeah, three-story house, the basement. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, they say that they insist John Bonet was sleeping, and they put her to bed. We can't really. That's what they say. We don't can't really guarantee that. At some point, John Bonet gets up. I think she got up on her own because her, and I don't think she wet the bed because she actually she did wet herself that night, uh, but it seemed to be at the time of death. But her bed had actually not been wet. And her pillow was found on the kitchen counter, which to me seems like she got out of bed with her pillow and walked down in the kitchen and put her pillow on the countertop. So I think she, like, got up on her own. Um, We know that she ate some pineapple. uh, And we know that there was pineapple left out in a bowl on the dining room table that had Patsy and Burke's fingerprints on the bowl and then a glass of iced tea that had been drunk that only had Burke's fingerprints on it. Um, she gets hit in the head, and that hit in the head is becomes fatal. 
she is somehow ends up in the basement, whether on her own or she was taken down there. We don't really know. She was. And then and then a crime scene was staged after this fatal blow to the head. So she was possibly sexually assaulted and then wiped clean. She was possibly poked with something or the intruder theory is that she's tasered. Um, we sh- she urinates. I think she gets strangled. She gets a head wound. She's in the basement. She seems dead. She gets strangled with a garrot, which is crazy, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, she urinates, and then after she urinates and is strangled face down, and then she's carried to the next room, placed on her back, her hands are bound, and tape is put over her mouth. Um, so all of that was staged. So you think that um, the taping of the mouth and the hand tying happened post-mortem? Yeah, well, at least when she was unconscious. Um, okay. But... So she never, but I think it was post-mortem because she never fought against the tape. It was like one piece of duct tape over her mouth and she never even like opened her mouth or tried to get her tongue out. Like she never fought against it. And I think that there, there was like some sort of like fluid trapped between the duct tape and her mouth that was like post-mortem body fluid type. Okay. Um, and then her, the, the binds on her hands were loose, like it was just really staging but they never found the duct tape and they never found the the twine in the house like whatever they used and okay. she was also she was strangled with rope and a garrot and some people are saying it really wasn't used as a, the way a, gar- a garrot is intended but i never heard that term until this case but it's a piece of wood that you is tied to a piece of rope and you use that to strangle people and I think that you use the garage is like used for leverage um so that's kind of is it kind of like a tourniquet like you know you could put a like a band yeah. around someone's leg and you take the piece of whatever the wood and twist it yeah I mean you would twist it on the piece of rope so I mean I think okay. I think I have heard that it does seem because you've asked me that before we talked about this briefly and I was like what's a tourniquet like how you would use it oh, yeah, like yeah. that and I looked it up and I think that it could be something similar so they're they're specifically used to strangle people yes oh that's so creepy okay it is but I yeah so here's the thing is I don't know like for me the dad is a wild card I mean I at some point obviously he got involved in this staging like so here's the so it's like the ultimate who done it. There's three people in the house. A nine-year-old boy who possibly is, you know, who is a suspect, the mother and the dad. And so I think I've given my excuses or like my possible reasons, motives why the mother did this, like the parental rage. So let's talk about the brother. And Cindy, who do you think in the house actually did it? Do you have like a... I, I think it was probably an accident with the, the older brother. Um, he probably hit her. Okay. They argued. You know, kids are. Mm-hmm. They have. They're little sociopaths. They have. They don't really have a lot of. They have empathy, but they don't have the, the, foresight to put their actions together with consequences all the time. They're de- they're developing that, and we're developing that until we're about twenty five years old. So, hitting somebody too hard with something because you're mad. Especially if you have a kid that has like some issues with impulse control, which I'm not really sure what Burke's issues are, but I have an mention. idea. I think that okay. I don't think he's really a sociopath type. I think that little kid is a psychopath, and here's why. He so like I think there's a prevailing theory that he was eating pineapple and she came along and like mm-hmm. stole a piece out of the bowl and he got pissed and hit her on the head with a large flashlight. Um, and I. Th- and he had hit her in the head before with, with the a golf, golf club, club. Right? Yeah, yeah, out of like out of anger, and nothing. She didn't die that time. You know, I don't even know how much she was injured at that time. But he had done that before out of anger, and there seemed to be some evidence that perhaps. I mean, I think that there's strong evidence that John Bonet was um, repeatedly sexually abused by someone. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems like it could have been the brother. And 
And then the piece that I find most interesting is, um, so he's nine, but he had this issue where he would spread his fecal matter on John Bonet's belongings and in her room. And for a nine-year-old, I think that is extremely disturbing behavior. That's vindictive. It's it's like yeah, it's like a vindictive streak. It's vindictive, but it's also like very kind of primal and it just like when you're past two years old or past that stage that potty train stage you really should have no interest in your your own fecal matter especially (laughs) enough to like spread it on on people's belongings and so you know he must have gotten in huge trouble because John Bonet is not going to clean that up mom's gonna clean that up well i mean but they're rich people they have like maids and shit you know what i mean i guess that's true um although their house was like a fucking pigsty but they did like have help and they had like a nanny or like someone besides the mother help clean mm-hmm. it up. But the reason why it's really interesting in this case is because the police, when it became, when the house became a murder scene, a crime scene, they found that Burke, the nine year old brother, had spread poop all over John Bunny's room and her Christmas gifts. And he had to have done it that Christmas day. Or. So it's possible that he even did it, like, at the time that she was unconscious and maybe not strangled yet or things hadn't been staged yet. Like, there's, I think, evidence that points to the fact that he actually shit all over her her things. Like, that... Oh, my God. <laughs> that night, you know? Like, that night. I have night. to say, as being a mom of a small child... Who is revolted by his poop? By the way, he has a good. One of those that's a great sign. That is, that's yeah. perfect. You know, good <laughs> poop is gross. It smells bad. It smells bad because we're not supposed to touch it, because it's full of bad stuff. Great. If I had a kid that was spreading shit on anything in the house, that was like you said beyond the age of two, that yeah. kid would be in therapy major hardcore th- major therapy, therapy like yeah. several times a week because that is not normal behavior so so there are some people because of this behavior from Burke and whatever that believe that he did it and so I I think it's within the realm of possibility um yeah I personally think that if he did it he would have had to do it in the basement because I don't think he could have carried her down there on his own. No, that's where that's where it, the the parents come into play. If it happens somewhere upstairs. Now, if he lured her downstairs to hit her with a flashlight, then it's premeditated and it's even creepier than if he just flew off the handle and hit her like everybody, you know, like that's okay. Siblings getting too rough, someone gets a concussion, that kind of stuff happens. But if he lured her into the basement, unless a parent took them down there to kind of cover his ass. But here's the thing that that I think is really interesting about this case is that if he just hit her in the head, you would think that a normal response from a parent would be to call 911 and that nothing would happen to him because it was an accident. Right. And at that point, they could have even blamed it on her. You know, like she fell and hit her head or something. So I personally think this is like what I, to me, what makes sense the most when I've thought about it. Um, because that's, I feel like, what any normal person would do. Even if the mother accidentally did it, I still, I'm like, why wouldn't you just call 911? I feel like You just say it's an accident, you know, and you don't know, like they didn't know at that point that that head blow was fatal. When it happened, she became unconscious. No one knew what was, you know, right. Assumed that she was dead. So what I actually think makes the most sense based on the fact that obviously at some point or the whole time the parents got involved and staged a crime scene to make it look like a kidnapping gone wrong and some intruder broke in and did it, whatever. Um, The only reason I would think that someone would do something like that is because things really were out of control. And so I think if Burke did it, he did it and then strangled John Bonet and then got his parents involved, and that's why they had to stage it the way they did because a head wound or head blow you could explain as an accident but a strangulation like that with a garrote like you really can't explain that and so I think that um because the room that she was found in 
in the basement actually had Christmas gifts, or I actually think there were Burke's birthday gifts because his birthday is in January. And the gifts had been opened as a, like, like a kid, like Patsy told the police that she had opened the gifts to check to see what was in them because she had forgotten. But they weren't like opened in a way like an adult would do it to check to see what it was. They were like a piece of paper was like ripped off the middle of this, like a, like a kid had done it. So mm-hmm. I think some people think that I Burke was having a snack, went down to the basement to check out these toys, and John Bonet. Went downstairs, saw the pineapple, had some pineapple. Mm. Went down in the basement to see what her brother was up to. They are, you know, messing around with these toys they shouldn't be messing with. Something happens. She gets hit in the head. And I think a couple, like the dad and the mom, said that they had used that heavy flashlight that night around the house instead of turning on lights so that they weren't, like, disturbing things or whatever so, so like weird <laughs> like the brother had a f- took the flashlight in the basement so he could see without having lights on and she comes down and they get in a fight and he hits her in the basement were she- they worried about the electrical bill like what i don't understand why won't you turn a light on a giant house like they that? said well they said initially because they were carrying john buddy to bed and they didn't want to wake her up okay fair enough so they All used right. the, this giant mag light flashlight i don't know it's fucking weird it's all weird um it's all weird okay so um so the kids are playing in the basement she gets nailed with the flashlight and then the brother for whatever reason maybe he thought it was like a tourniquet thing that he learned in in boy scouts he like strangled her went up to her room shit all over her stuff and then like woke up mom and got mom involved mom sees that like the kid is strangled there's no way you can explain that that's a fucking accident and so they staged this whole thing that's to me what makes most sense yeah yeah is that the unless the mother did it and they staged it from there or or we never talk about the dad yeah nobody ever really talks about the dad right so it's weird it's just all weird and then so then the other weird things. The crime scene is clearly staged. Uh, there's a ransom note found that is like three or four times longer than the longest ransom note ever written, written in history. Uh, um, it's, it has really weird wording in it. Um, and I don't know, like the ransom shit was, was bullshit, obviously, and and. We don't really need to discuss it a lot because the ransom note kind of points to, like, the intruder did it theory, and I'm just sticking with, like, someone in the house did it. But who did it in the house? I have no idea. The more I try to figure it out, the less I know. Because, like, everyone in the house denied that they ever saw pineapple until, like, everyone – and then, like, the next interview, they're saying, like, they love pineapple, and then, like, Burke is showing a picture of the bowl of pineapple, and he, like, has never – even heard the word pineapple before it's just like the behavior is so odd well it's kind of like when you get caught in a lie like there's a piece of evidence and you oh i've never seen that before i don't know what i don't i don't even what's what's pineapple i don't even know what that is and then you forget because you've lied i mean i do think if, if if it was like the catalyst for the argument that caused her to get hit by him. Right. And I can see why you just like, I don't know anything about what's a pineapple. I don't know what that is. Like you try to distance yourself as much as possible and you end up becoming suspicious because you're trying to cover something up. That's why I really lean towards that. Like Burke did it. Mm hmm. And at, and I, yeah. And that his mother, the parents, but the, I think maybe the mother first got involved like late later. Yeah, I mean, that seems reasonable. I don't think that, I don't, the strangling is what is the weird part about it is, you're right, if it's an accidental head, you know, blunt force trauma, you know, knocks her unconscious and then they try to cover it up because they think she's dead. I I don't know. It doesn't make any sense because obviously you would, for me, I would think that you would go check for a pulse and see if their kid was breathing and then just run to get a phone you know but if you're right if that's why i would think that further, it's the, that the brother like that yeah. that's yeah it doesn't make any sense for anybody wouldn't. else in the house 
You, right. A parent would react. An adult would react differently. They would. They would check for a pulse and feel a pulse and maybe, like, just call 911. Right. But then for me, like, yeah, but then you take it further. Like, that – what makes sense is the brother did it, but what makes sense is the brother did it and then strangled her and then got the parents involved. Mm-hmm. Because he knew he – he didn't think, what am I going to do after this? He was just in the moment, like, doing his, you know – whatever but did he strangle her to to like because he it was like a tourniquet fix or because like why did he like because he wanted to kill her more like what do you think would be the reasoning for a nine-year-old then to after you accidentally hit your sister in the head and like so I think that they've kind of determined based on her brain swelling that she was hit on the head and then strangled 45 minutes to two hours later so what does he do like in that time and then that's when people speculate in that time he sexually like uh, assaulted her or abused her and then he like shit all over her stuff um and the like the parents didn't get involved until after she was strangled so like like what is happening in that time is he being like a crazy little sadistic fuck um or is he, like, panicking and trying to be a Boy Scout and, like, put a tourniquet? Like, his sister's head is hurt, and so he's going to... Oh. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Put a tourniquet on it, and oops, like, that really didn't work. So now I, I don't know what to do, and I better, like, let my mom know. Oh, that is... That's, like, a very logical step to take for a kid. Like, oh, her head's bleeding. I know how to make bleeding stop. Well, her head wasn't bleeding. Like, that's why. I, oh, okay. I don't even know if the parents were, like, aware that there was a head wound, if this is the scenario that happened. Mm-hmm. Because she wasn't, like, they didn't know until they did an autopsy that her skull was cracked and that would have ultimate, like, the strangulation killed her, but the head wound would have if she wasn't strangled. Okay, okay. So... But I th- he still knew he knocked her on the head and her head was hurt. Yeah, now the other option is to look at she's being sexually molested by an adult. An adult, she says she's going to tell. The adult gets mad, hits her, knocks her unconscious, and then strangles her because they know that they're going to get caught if she wakes up. Right. And says something. Right. That's another horrible horrible option to have right and i do think that the mother is a big part of this because she never went to bed i mean they were supposed to leave that next morning and they have like a second home and and they're gonna like spend the rest of the holidays there or whatever and they had like a private jet they had to like leave at seven o'clock the next morning and they weren't packed so that's what the every the mom said everyone went to bed and she's like started packing for this trip and you know, there's a lot of evidence that she never went to sleep that night. So I feel like she was she was awake the whole time everything was happening. It seems pretty logical that she was involved either from the beginning or really early or, you know, kind of involved throughout a lot of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, if she's awake. But if she's she the adult, if she's the adult, it would seem to me that it probably wasn't the dad because we know the dad was sleeping that's true. That's true. That's probably why a lot of people didn't look into him because he it seems, and I think he like kind of has an alibi, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it it does seem as if he was sleeping that night, and he probably was sleeping while all this was happening, and we know that the mom wasn't. So I think that's why she probably gets a lot of attention. So it's really between her and Burke, you know? Right. He probably the dad probably woke up finding this shit already laid out. The ransom note is being written. John Bonet is in the basement. I mean, what do you do? Do you turn in your whole family? Yeah, and he was like, he had a billion dollar computer company or something like that. You know, I mean, he had a lot on the line for to not go along with what was happening in a way, you know. I'm sure that's what, you know, if Patsy did try to cover for Burke, it was the same sort of thing. Like, I have, I've already lost one child. Do, am I going to lose both of them? Because he's going to get put into an institution or something, the very least. Because the other thing I heard, too, or have read theories about the garage is that it really wasn't a garage, is that it was something. It was like a, like a handle to a kite, or it was like 
a handle to a wagon that had been broken. Like it was a piece of rope that had a handle on it that had been used for other purposes. And it wasn't, and so it was just grabbed and used in this case. Conveniently. Conveniently and not like intended to be made a, as a, a garage. Even though I think like it was made from one of Patsy's paint brushes and they found like the rest of it, you know, nearby. Mm-hmm. Although they, that doesn't mean that it happened that night. Like it still could have been used for other for a toy reason because they had a playroom in the basement I guess they played down there a lot so like that could have just been around for any kind of purpose hmm. but yeah it's, it's fascinating it's interesting it is and it we'll is. and we'll probably never we'll probably never know no the brother will have to say something and I doubt that would happen or the dad would have to say something and I doubt that that would happen if they do, it'll be like a deathbed confession. I think if anyone was going to have a deathbed confession, it would be it would have been Patsy. Nah, she's taking that shit with her. I mean, but she's dead. But I know she took the shit with her. <laughs> but do you remember, like, a s- interesting side fact, fun fact? When you and I lived in Santa Rosa, was one that John Mark Carr like confessed to killing John Benet Ramsey, and he was extradited from Thailand to Santa Rosa County. Oh, really? To, to Sonoma County. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, like I have a – remember when I used to like save all those newspaper headings? Mm-hmm. I have like – um, this is from that time period. So I have a headline that's like John Mark Carr extradited to Santa Rosa, you know, confesses to killing John Bonet. It was like all bullshit. He – he lied. Like, he wasn't even in the state of Colorado at the time that the murder happened. Oh, I know. He was just crazy. Like, one of those crazy guys. Yeah. <laughs> he just wanted some notoriety. Notoriety? Ugh, can't talk. He wanted to be involved in something important. And he did. I mean, they still, you know, now when you Google the yeah, case. Yeah, he gets talked about. You just talked about him. So, yeah, I mean, there. <laughs> well, I talked because, fun fact, because, you know, we were living there at the time. But, yeah, I mean, there's yeah, like, yeah. A, like a wikipedia section devoted to this fucking asshole you know oh, I so know. God. He, he did it i know he got his name I out know. there he did it so yeah so that's my cold case great good job i love it good job okay so here's mine this one um you probably haven't heard about it although i heard about it first time a couple years ago and since then it has blown up like i did some research and there have been a million bloggers and podcasters who have talked about this case. So um, this is the murder of a cold case murder of Dorothy Jane Scott. So here we go. We're going to start at the end and work our way backwards. Ooh. Yeah. So a little after 7 a.m. on August 6, 1984, uh, Mako Construction Company foreman by the name of Jesse Loza is out laying some lines with his construction crew for PG&E in um, like the northeast area of Anaheim. It's kind of, there's houses everywhere around it, but this area is completely uninhabited. And uh, they find the partial skeletal remains of a human and a dog lying next to each other like minutes after Loza jokes, watch out for dead bodies. So it's not uncommon to find bodies in un- uninhabited areas in California because yeah. Native people lived here for thousands of years. So a lot of the times when you find bones, they're ancient burial grounds. Oh, interesting. Unfortunately, yeah, I work in a park that is also an archaeological site where the museum is that I work at. And uh, bodies every once in a while, remains, not bodies like the flesh, but uh, skeletons will wash into the creek and... It's because they were buried there thousands of years ago by the people who lived here before the Spanish arrived. Hmm. And it's not a big deal. The tribe is like, just leave them. <laughs> right. <laughs> They've right. already been buried. Just leave them. Right. Okay. So the partial remains were scattered. This is the dog, too. Were scattered over a 25-foot radius, which suggests animal activity and either a very shallow burial site or just a body dump. Um, the marine remains were bleached white from the sun and were um, partially burned from a brush fire that had taken place two years prior. So they'd been there for several years by the time that they were discovered by the construction company. 
So the Orange County medical examiner uh, by the name of Richard Rodriguez speculated that the individual was out hiking with their dog when something befell both of them and they just died and nobody ever reported them missing or, you know, nobody, nobody came looking for them. They didn't tell anybody where they had gone and they just decomposed and there they are now. Sounds reasonable. Yeah. So the, the skeleton was like, there was a full femur, um, a pelvis, which was great because they could help sex the skeleton if they couldn't find anything, um, remarkable about it but there was also a skull full skull with a full set of teeth that were full of cavities and fillings so sort of like perfect nobody has the same dental records we can totally just do a dental search and figure out who this individual is and it turned out that the remains belonged to dorothy jane scott who had gone missing four years earlier so Dorothy was a 32-year-old single mom of a four-year-old son, and the pair lived with Dorothy's aunt, Shanti Jacob Scott, in Stanton, California. So Dorothy would commute to Anaheim for work, which is about 20, 20 minutes away, and she worked as a secretary for Swingers Psych Shop and Custom John's Head Shop. And uh, she worked in the back, so she didn't even deal with the customers or anything. Her dad had been the previous owner of Swinger's Psych Shop, and um, which was like basically just like weed paraphernalia. And um, he was now the kind of handyman. So people, everybody in the, the business knew his number and would call him and he would come and fix things that they needed to, to have anything fixed. And since her parents lived in Anaheim, where the shop was, she would drop her son off when she had to work and they would watch him. Um, so sometime early in 1980, Dorothy started receiving really disturbing, creepy phone calls from an unidentified male while she was at work. He never called her at home, only at work. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and refer to the caller as her stalker now, because back in 1980, we didn't have any anti-stalking stalking laws, and the newspaper only ever referred to him as the caller, and all the bloggers I ever read, read about only referred to him as a caller. He fucking stalked her, and we know he stalked her because he would tell her about intimate details from her life while he was on the phone call with her, what she'd done with her son, where they had gone, you know, what time she'd gotten to work, where she went to church. He fucking stalked her. Yeah, I wonder why he never about. called her at home. I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe um, it was unlisted number. Like I just, yeah, there, there were no remaining speculation about why he never called her at home. He only called her while she was at work. Um, so at one time he actually even left her a gift of a dead rose on her car, a dead red rose. And uh, Dorothy told her mom that she recognized the voice, but she couldn't place it. So she was acquainted with this person, possibly, but had no idea who he might have been. And uh, according to friends and family, Dorothy was pretty introverted. She liked to be home with her son. She was friendly and outgoing with people that she knew. She rarely dated. Uh, she didn't have a boyfriend. And she went to church every Sunday. And um, a few weeks before she was abducted, the stalker took a much more menacing tone and scared the shit out of this poor woman. And he said, quote, unquote, okay, now you're going to come my way. And when I get you alone, I will cut you into little bits. So no one will ever find you. Did he say this on the phone? Yes. He said it on the phone to her. And, uh, she told her mom immediately what had happened. And so now Dorsey's like, ah, fuck, now I'm scared. Um, before it was just, you know, creepy calls where he would call like either professing his love for her or kind of mad at her because she had talked to somebody that he didn't want her talking to. And now she's like, should I get a gun? I really don't want a gun. So she opts for taking self-defense classes in karate. So on May 27th, 1980, um, Dorothy drops her son off at her parents' place and heads over to Swingers for a after hours work meeting. While she's there, she notices, notices that one of her co-workers has this inflamed bite on the back of his hand and um, a red line running up his arm. So she says, 
you know, that's really not cool. Can I take you to the hospital? And he doesn't want to go at first. Finally, he says, okay. And another one of their coworkers, Pam Head, take Conrad Bostrom to the hospital. On their way to the UCI Medical Center, uh, Dorothy's driving her 1973 Toyota station wagon with the other two people inside. They stop by her parents' place so she can tell them what they're doing because they're watching her son. And while she's there, she changes her headscarf. So she's wearing one that's either red and she changes to a black one or black one and she changes to a red one. Either way, she changes the color of the headscarf she's wearing and they head to the hospital. And while Conrad's being treated for an infected Black Widow spider bite, Pam and Dorothy chat, they read magazines, they watch television in the waiting room until about 11 p.m. when Conrad is released. He and Pam say they're going to go to the pharmacy to fill his prescription. And Dorothy says, okay, I'm going to hit the bathroom and I'll go get the car and pull it up around front because Conrad doesn't look well enough to walk that far. So I'm just going to grab a car. So this is the first time that Dorothy and Pam have been separated since they've been at the hospital. And they wait. The, the pharmacy takes about five minutes to fill the prescription. And then they head to the entrance, but there's no Dorothy. So they wait a little bit longer. Still no Dorothy. So they decide, well, we'll just walk to where the car was originally parked. And as they're walking to the car, here comes Dorothy's station wagon, high beams on, racing towards them. It swerves the last second, heads for the exit, disappears, and that's it. So now Pam and Conrad are standing there like, what the fuck just happened? Where did Dorothy go? So they're thinking like, well, maybe they got a call. She got a call from her dad at the front desk that something had happened to her son. And maybe we'll just, we'll just wait and see what happens. So they wait a few hours, wait a couple of hours and nothing. Dorothy doesn't come back. So then they go to the hospital security and security is like, ah, it's probably fine. She'll be back. They wait a little bit longer, like, fuck this. We're going to call her parents. So they call her dad's place and say, have you seen Dorothy? No, of course not. She's with you. No, she's not. So then they report her missing. And 5 a.m. on May 28th, so that would be the following morning, Dorothy's car is discovered 10 miles from the hospital, burning. Someone set her car on fire. A week after the abduction... Dorothy's parents began receiving phone calls from an unidentified man who would ask, are you related to Dorothy or is Dorothy there? And sometimes he'd mock and say, um, I have her before hanging up. And the caller always called when Dorothy's dad wasn't around. We'd always call when um, Vera Scott was there, her mom. So now Dorothy's stalker is stalking her parents or specifically her mother. Um, they took the, they took the phone calls to the police and they tried to trace the calls, but the caller never stayed on long enough for it to be traced. Um, so then Dorothy's parents go to the local paper and offer a $25,000 reward for any information on their daughter's abduction. And on June 12th, shortly after the article was published, a man called the paper and uh, Pat Riley, the editorial manager of the Santa Ana Register, took the call. And the man on the other end claimed to have killed Dorothy. He said, I killed Dorothy. I killed her. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. And the stalker revealed key information that the police and the family and their article in the paper had withheld. He knew why they were at the hospital because of the spider bite. No one had ever said why they had gone to the hospital, just that they had gone. And he knew the color of the headscarf she was wearing, another detail that the police had kept out of the media. Um, he claims that the stalker claims that Dorothy called him from the hospital, even though Dorothy and Pam hadn't been out of each other's sight. So now the problem with the phone call is that I looked it up. Um, only like professionals, like medical professionals at this time in 1980 had pagers. So this guy wouldn't even had a pager. Dorothy probably would have had to call a home phone or a pay phone because we didn't have cell phones yet. And it takes forever to get anywhere in Southern California. There's even at night, it's just surface streets, any of that stuff. It just takes forever to get anywhere. So I think that in this guy's delusion about 
thinking that he's in a relationship with this woman because he thinks she's cheating on him when she takes a man to the hospital that he rationalizes being there at the hospital, having followed her there, that she's called him. Because, you know, stalkers know what they're doing is wrong. They know. They're delusional. They know what they're doing is wrong because they hide it. If they didn't think it was wrong, they wouldn't hide their behavior. And since he's never identified himself to her, he knows what he's doing is wrong. Well, I mean, or, you know, the delusion has, they believe that, no one understands what they're doing yet you know so like that's why they have to hide it because until like the secret of the universe is revealed to the world they're the only ones who know right and so they they, they're they're talking yeah and so everyone else is wrong so they have to keep it secret because everyone else is crazy and they'll get like persecuted for it so you're but you're saying that pam never saw dorothy make a phone call no, she never made it. She just went to the bathroom and got the car. She wouldn't have had time to make a phone call, really. Was Dorothy's dad ever a suspect? I don't think so. Really? Interesting. Yeah. He was home. Um, I, oh, well, here, we're, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll, we'll get rid of any suspicion on that one. Okay. So um, let's see. For three years... Dorothy's mom receives these calls sporadically until one day her husband comes home early and he gets the phone call and then the phone calls stop. Yeah, but and was anyone there to witness his phone call that he got? I don't know if, if the mom answered the call and then gave it to her husband. Okay. Uh, I'm not really sure how that works, um, but I can see why you would think that. Um, and um, these calls stop until... Dorothy's remains are discovered and it's made public that she, her body was found. Um, and then the caller calls a couple of times and asks if Dorothy is home before hanging up. The Scots never changed their phone number because they hoped that one day Dorothy stalker would allow them to talk to her because they still had hope that she might be alive. Okay. So the list of suspects is really short pretty much non-existent there's absolutely zero physical evidence no dna evidence no fingerprints her car has been burned the bones have been out in the elements for so long there's just nothing left they don't even know how she died they have no idea what the cause of death was and have they thought about any um well-known serial killers in california at that time like the zodiac killer or was richard ramirez or like People who kind of had this M.O., like young woman, she was stalked. They called newspapers. Sounds kind of Zodiac a little bit. It does. Um, I agree. But I don't think that there was – yeah, nothing was ever mentioned. And I've tried to look up, like, people who called, stuff like that. But there's really not a database to look up people's M.O.s. Right. And correlating, you know, cases and things like that. I wish there were. That would be really awesome. But counties don't really talk to each other, especially back in 1980. Like, they weren't really collaborating that much yet. Because I think it's even been speculated that whoever killed the Black Dahlia was, like, the Zodiac killer. You know, it's like these serial killers or these killings that go on in California for, like, 30 years. I think some people almost link them to the same person. Well, yeah, I mean, there's definitely similarities between what people do. I mean, unless there's something that really stands out, how they murder and stuff. I mean, there's, I don't want to say there's only so many ways to murder a person, but (laughs) there's definitely a myriad ways of what you can do with their bodies afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I don't know if, um, yeah, I don't really know enough about, like, there's not, there's no leads, nothing. Like, the case has been cold since it started. Um, Okay, let's see. So her ex, um, who's also the father of her son, was in Missouri the time of the abduction. Um, one blogger who I have a huge problem with <laughs> says that she, uh, or he or she interviewed um, Dorothy's son in 2017. And he said that the brother of one of Dorothy's coworkers um, had an obsession with her. And I guess at the time the police looked into him as a suspect, but they had to let him go for some reason. Like they're just, they couldn't get anything to stick to him, I guess. And this blogger names him 
as the murderer, pretty much, or the prime suspect, but um, he no charges were ever brought against him, so I kind of feel like he's a private citizen. And he ended up passing away in 2014, so maybe they thought it was okay to name him, even though his family is still alive. Um, so that's it. There's just nobody. Well, and to... I know that, like, we're progressive now and times like they are now are just not like they were then, but I'm going to say in 1980, like... Whoever frequented or worked at like a sex shop slash head shop, um, it's pretty fringy. It's like not, it's not a, really an acceptable part of society. Yeah, and she also worked in the back, so she wasn't even up in the front where she was, in, you know, interacting with people very much. But I mean, that's why I am. I mean, I I would need to research more and like need proof. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, it's got to be her dad or something like that. You know, it's like someone that was close to her. But just because she worked in the back doesn't mean that no one ever saw her and then just started to follow her or like knew that that was the owner's daughter and had a general idea of her name. Right, right. I suppose that I tried to look up any kind of case files that might have been online about it, but there was nothing. They're just news articles and speculation by bloggers. So it was pretty, finding actual facts was pretty hard to do. So did this dog like die with her or was it a different time and just coincidence that they were together, the bones? No, I don't think it was a coincidence. It was, um, they were laid next to each other and I guess the bones were about the same old, same age. They both had the same charring on them, so they'd been there about the same amount of time. Yeah. And um, I don't know where this idea got started, but most of the bloggers say that the dog was buried on top of her. Like, her bones were underneath the dog bones. But in the initial police, not police reports, but the initial initial, um, articles was that they were next to each other, side by side. Um, it doesn't look like she was buried because of the, the animal activity with the bones being scattered over a 25 foot radius, unless it was really shallow. I would say that the dog and Dorothy were dumped next to each other. Mm -hmm. And from, from my time in the literature realm and being a romantic teenager, like I was, Roses are very symbolic as to love and relationships and romance. And to leave a dead rose on somebody's car means that you're very fond of symbolism. Right. And a little bit morbid. Now, dogs in our society have two different connotations. One of them is loyalty and man's best friend. And the other one is he's a dog. He's dirty. He's he humps everything that is around. So by dumping her with a dog speaks a little bit to the mentality or the the psychology of the person who's doing it. He's very fond of symbolism. Right. And uh, he either thinks that Dorothy broke his loyalty by taking Conrad to the hospital because it's another man, Mm -hmm. or he thinks that she's on par with a dirty dog. Right. And we don't know if the dog was his dog or a dog that he found on the street. We have no idea. Right. We don't know who the person is. Right. I but would definitely... probably speculate that they're delusional. And that's frightening because who knows, like, in their mind what they were able to rationalize as far as the dog, oh, people, you know, yeah, and the rose yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And people – and the whole idea that he was going to chop her up into little pieces, like, he told her that, it's like – there's a very dark fantasy that somebody really wants to play out, perhaps. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, it's very controlling and um, antisocial. Yeah, it sounds like they need medication in 1980 <laughs> in California. I'm sure that that really wasn't. Oh, yeah. Reagan came through this place and just let everybody go. He just yeah the streets with mentally ill people. Oh my God. Thank you, Reagan. Thank you. Still dealing with it, but at least, like... Still dealing with yeah. it. Um, Keep them medicated. I know, right? <laughs> Thank God for medication. Take it, please. Please. The society at large thanks you. 
And we thank you for doing for your, your civic service. doodle. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for keeping the streets <laughs> safe. Um, in 1994, Dorothy's fa- father passed away on his daughter's birthday. And then in 2002, 22 years after her daughter was abducted and murdered, Vera Scott passed away. And they never discovered what happened to their daughter, and the crime remains unsolved. Aww. And that is the story of Dorothy Jane Scott. Yeah. Yeah, what really intrigued me about this one was the dog being buried with dog bones. or No, dog, I mean, I think you're bones. right. The symbolism, like the dog and the rose, like... Yeah, it's just kind of like a romantic thing in a very twisted sort of way. I mean, yeah. you look at like um, Vermeer paintings, um, the Dutch Dutch guy, mm-hmm. did the girl with the pearl earring. He did um, he did a, a painting where it's a, a marriage contract, and in it they have a dog because dogs are loyalty. Right. They symbolize loyalty. It's just it's kind of something that's been in our collective social mind for hundreds of years. Ever since, I guess, we bred dogs down from wolves and kept them around to keep us safe and take hunting and things. I much prefer the work that we did with cats. Thank you very much. (laughs) Now, that's an animal that we mostly have domesticated. Sort of. I mean, they are like tiny tigers, aren't they? They are, but they're just so great because I think I read something about like who's not jealous the way a cat sleeps but that's just hundreds of generations of having really like no predators because cats are able to curl up anywhere and hide out and sleep so that's why like they just sleep with their bellies like that because they just have zero fear (laughs) they just like don't give a fuck like nothing is coming for them you know i always i always said it um whenever my cat lizard face would have her belly exposed like that and she would kind of like get that one eye on you like the half lidded eye like hey you want to get a taste of this and like it's a trap (laughs) don't touch that belly you will get mauled (laughs) don't touch it it's a trap (laughs) she just wants to get you into your safe spot so she can attack you cats are the coolest odin really wants a cat and i said well you have to clean up their poop and he's like no that's your job Cat, nope. uh, cat poop's not bad. You just get the right litter, and yeah, I know. I'm gonna wait till he's older. Maybe we have a yard. Oh no, God! Apartment living is so hard with animals. Yeah, I mean, you'd want a cat that could go outside. Mm-hmm. Would be nice. Yeah, and then they can just poop outside. That's true. And yeah. no one has to There's worry no about the yeah, no maintenance. My cat had a litter box inside, but he would hold it until he could get outside because he just loved pooping outside. I mean, really, like, after a couple of drinks, who doesn't like pooping outside? <laughs> well, me, because I'm so uptight, and I, like, <laughs> it would require psyllium husk and then coffee the next morning, and we'll give it a whirl. <laughs> no promises. Okay, well, how about back in the day when we'd have a couple of drinks to go pee outside? Oh, yeah, I'll do that all the time. Yeah, that's great. I'll do that now without liquor. I'll just, I just need liquid. (laughs) Yeah, that is a key ingredient to making urine. To have that liquid. (laughs) Well, we did it. We did it. Woohoo! So thanks for listening. This has been Demi World. You can find us at demiworld.net and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Demi World Podcast. And remember to like, rate, and subscribe. Thanks. Bye. Bye.